The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guests or hosts are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced or the Molecular Research Incorporated. Welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. We are all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. In each episode, we will feature very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to live their best lives naturally. Thanks for tuning in to Supplementing Health. Today, we are joined by Dr. Nikki Nefren, naturopathic doctor and Thula to discuss the impacts pregnancy and hormones can have on your mental health. Welcome, Nikki. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So I think we've all heard of postpartum depression or um, other changes like that happening after a child comes, especially with the stress of getting into your new routines and figuring out the whole being a parent thing. So how common is it for women to experience mental health shifts due to pregnancy? So I would say it's pretty common and we're seeing an increase in the PMADS, which is perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, That's during pregnancy and also postpartum. So previous to the pandemic, the statistics were about one in seven people in pregnancy would experience some sort of mood disorder, um, either anxiety or depression or a mixture of the two. And now we're seeing you know, upwards of one in four. That's more recent research in the last year, suggesting that one in four people are reporting symptoms consistent with a diagnosis of postpartum depression or anxiety um, or in pregnancy. Wow, that's almost double. That's crazy how much that's risen. Yeah, yeah. It really speaks to, we'll get into this, but it really speaks to all of the environmental factors that influence our mental health. It's not just what's happening physiologically. I like to say it's not just serotonin. So that's really underlining how much influence our environment, how much support we have, um, even things like access to being able to move our bodies. Um, And certainly in areas like the GTA where recreational facilities were closed down, at one point parks were even you know, not considered safe, that really impacts people in pregnancy and postpartum in terms of being able to get out and move their bodies, which is one of the things that we know that really reduces um, symptoms. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And I'm sure too, not having your support network around through all of those changes as well, right? When we've been quarantined and not able to see even family members, let alone friends and all of that. Absolutely huge. Yeah, the lack of support is it, one of the number one things that would that drive those mood changes. And certainly in, you know, as, I think especially for first-time parents who are going through, you know, they don't know what to expect. Um, and they probably maybe assumed that they would be able to have, you know, their mom or their sister or, or somebody else come to help them or in person. Um, even accessing, we know that people are having trouble accessing healthcare or they simply aren't accessing healthcare because of fears of going into an office. So, um, you know, going to midway for obstetrician appointments or even following up with family doctors. um, There's definitely a concern that lots of people are remaining undiagnosed or untreated because of the lack of um, care as part of the pandemic as well. So do you usually see these mental health shifts starting in pregnancy or is it more often postpartum or is there kind of an even mix across the board? Yeah, that's an interesting question because it's a bit of, uh, you know, is it the chicken or the egg that came first? We know that people who experience depression in pregnancy or anxiety in pregnancy are at higher risk of experiencing those same things postpartum. Um, So 
you know, if, if we're seeing somebody who's struggling in pregnancy, then then definitely we're preparing to support them differently postpartum. Sometimes for people, though, it it, it can come as a surprise postpartum. Um, and that's where the hormonal piece comes in as well, because we know that what happens after pregnancy, we have those hormones after the baby and the placenta is delivered. We have the largest single drop of our hormones in our lives. It's actually akin to going into menopause. That's how much our sex hormones drop right after a baby is born. And then they, and then, you know, the other milk producing and bonding hormones come on board. And that sort of adjustment happens in the first 48 hours post birth. And then we've got a few weeks as they, it sort of levels off. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, clinically, I'm seeing more in pregnancy now, more people identifying it um, in pregnancy. Uh, but, but traditionally, I think that in most of the time we're seeing more often postpartum disclosure, if that makes sense. Like people are realizing it more in postpartum, I think, than they do in pregnancy. The actual incidence is somewhat the same. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, do you think some of why more people are able to identify it now is because there's a greater awareness around what the symptoms are and what to look for um, and even that it exists in the first place? Absolutely. I think that there, you know, so there, here's one of the saving graces of social media is one area where I think there's a lot more education around what um, mental health looks like in pregnancy and postpartum, what those symptoms are. Um, and there's a lot more normalization of that, that transition, you know, which they call matrescence um, from you know, pre-pregnancy into becoming a parent. We see it also in fathers, by the way. We know that, you know, if one partner has a, a mental health disorder, a perinatal mental health disorder, that it's 50% chance that the, that the other partner will as well. So that also speaks back to what the environmental causes are, right? In terms of what are we looking at here for reasoning behind why people are struggling, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to say also that it's so, with um, the pandemic, we can actually see in that newer research that there's actually a map showing Canada. We can see it by region that it varies slightly by region, but um, it's it, and we're seeing it higher, for instance, in the Maritimes and lower in the prairies. And, and I think that's kind of really interesting research, be interesting research to dig into as well. Right. But um, those new statistics showing, yeah, up to 23 uh, percent is what they're showing in terms of um, how many people are reporting those symptoms right now. Previously, again, was about one in seven. Um, and for fathers, one in 10. Oh, interesting. I wonder, too, if there are any and maybe. Maybe you actually know this, but are there any stats as to if the season of birth plays into that? Like if it's winter and it's dark and gray and shorter, right. maybe be an increase yeah. in versus summer when people have more sun, vitamin D and things like that. Right. Yeah. You know what? I don't know if there's actually been any formal research done on that. That would be fascinating. Um, certainly from my own personal experience. Yeah. Winter babies are tougher. Because, you know, bundling them up, getting outside if you're in Canadian winters um, can be really tricky. Yes. And just also the lack of sunlight, it's harder to get to those social, you know, baby and mom or baby and dad music classes, all of those things. So I think it would definitely, I would assume that that's impacted by season, but I don't know if there's been any formal research on that yet. Um, and then, so have you noticed if people that have had uh, depression or anxiety or other mental health conditions prior to pregnancy, has being pregnant helped rebalance those things ever for them? Like can the hormones help um, improve those situations? Right. So sometimes some people feel really great in pregnancy and then we don't fully understand why that is. 
um, there's certainly, we know that estrogen in particular, estradiol can affect depression. So sometimes people feel better in pregnancy because both progesterone and estrogen are higher. But we also know that some people who would come in with a higher base level of estrogen feel worse because of that amount. So it sort of depends where somebody is in their own unique hormone picture coming in. Um, The same is true with progesterone. Progesterone tends to be like our smoothing over hormone. So lots of people in pregnancy will feel a little more, um, you know, calm or less reactive because progesterone actually affects us on our GABA receptors, which is the neurotransmitter. It sort of like calms everything down. Um, But it really does depend on the person because, again, like if someone's coming in and their estrogen is high, that extra estrogen can make them feel worse. And in terms of progesterone, there are also some people who are really sensitive not to the amount of the progesterone, but simply to that fluctuation. Um, You might see that also in people who struggle with other hormone changes like and you might see it, for instance, in perimenopause, or they might see that similar struggle happen when weaning if they've been breastfeeding, um, or even in um, ov- near, uh, near ovulation and their regular cycle. So, you know, it sort of depends on whatever that person's specific hormonal picture is. It's really unique to that person. So then besides our regular sex hormones, like our progesterone and our estrogen, that are coursing through our bodies our whole lives, there's also other hormones that come out specifically for pregnancy, like HCG. Do those right. hormones ever play into that mental health picture? So, well, so HCG, there's not been a lot of research done on or on the impacts specifically to pregnancy, depression, or postpartum depression. What happens is that that hormone signals the release to the body to release more of our sex hormones, right? So it's not I don't think HCG plays a huge picture, or at least we don't know that yet. But we do see other hormones in terms of if you imagine that there's like a triad of hormones and the sex hormones are on one um, point, and then we have our adrenal hormones and we have our thyroid hormones. And those all create sort of like a complex web of how they interact. And so during pregnancy, all of those hormones are still on board, right? And some of them are upregulated and some of them are, are downregulated. So we more often see things like thyroid hormones um, can really impact mood. They can impact mood outside of pregnancy and postpartum, but certainly that is exaggerated in pregnancy and postpartum, um, specifically in the first like four months before the fetus starts to produce its own thyroid hormone. So that's sort of one area where you might see, um, you know, extra changes happening or extra influence outside of specifically the sex hormones. The other is cortisol, which is our stress hormone or adrenal hormone. And that changes throughout pregnancy as well. Um, It's not really well understood, actually, about why, what those changes are about. But we know that in the third trimester, cortisol actually goes up naturally. And and we want it to be up naturally because it can help speed up the lung maturation of the baby. So that we would also feel that shift, right, in that third trimester towards you know, um, you know, maybe more stress-like responses from that cortisol, and that can that can aggravate mood disorders um, or mimic them. That's interesting. Uh, does that also play into like what we deem baby brain then, when uh, women have a harder time kind of focusing or remembering things, especially later on in pregnancy? Oh, interesting. Uh, you know what I. Uh, maybe it does. I'm not sure if cortisol is what's behind that. Um, certainly when we talk about actual baby brain, the studies that have been done on it so far show that actually those ch- that there are actual physical changes happening in the brain, likely mediated by hormones. I don't know if it's just cortisol or if it's really like that unique cocktail of the end of pregnancy um, that shift us towards being able to be more receptive and to take in information, essentially preparing us to be like thrown into, uh, you know, the classroom of parenting. Um, Because when you have your baby, of course, 
especially a first baby, but even subsequent ones, we're learning, we're, we're, we become super sensitive to the cues of those, of that baby, right? It's the reason why when people say like, you know, a ba- newborn baby is crying. And, and even if you talk to other mothers who, whose kids might even be older, hearing a newborn baby cry elicits a very strong response in um, the birthing parent. And that's because of those brain changes that make us super sensitive to them, increasing their, you know, chance of survival, essentially. Um, and whether or not we don't really quite understand how that how that's modulated in the brain. They're just starting to study that now. But we do see that the brain actually changes. We have more growth in our learning centers, for instance, um, during late pregnancy and early postpartum um, that last beyond that period. It's so fascinating how the body can do all these things completely outside of our awareness and control, I think. Totally. (laughs) Oh, it's, it's, you know, I, I like to say it's like, the most normal slash common thing, but it's also a miracle. The whole thing is, is so wild. And, um, and you know, the experience is wild for people too. I think that that's one of the things that we grossly underestimate is moving through that transition, even though it's very quote unquote normal, it's a huge transition, not only physiologically in your body, like, you know, your blood volume doubles and then it drops. Your hormones are 200 the times the normal rate and then they literally plummet. Um, but also from an emotional and mental perspective, you know, being responsible for another human being. Um, and then and then bringing into like that experience into our, our specific culture of around parenting, um, which right now is really, you know, quote unquote, impossible, not only in the pandemic, but I think even before that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stress on parents to parent a very specific way to sort of, you know, quote unquote, get it right. Um, And that is a huge, that's a huge influence on the mental health of parents, particularly primary parents, which are, who are usually the mother. You're not only just adjusting to what's happening in your body, um, but you're also adjusting to this new role and responsibility and your identity. You know, that's what the matriescence means, right? Is that identity, it's like the word comes from, you know, ma- you know, maternal, but also adolescence. It's like a puberty, a second puberty almost. Um, into becoming a parent and what that means. And in between that, sandwiched in between those two things is this massive experience of having given birth, which really in terms of, you know, perinatal mental health is huge. That impact is, can't be um, underestimated of what the birth experience was like and what the early days of postpartum are like can influence um, postpartum depression and anxiety risk. A lot. What uh, role does like our societal changes that our ancestors didn't have, like social media and stuff, playing into that? Because I think even aside from parenting and um, like being a new mother and like you said, shifting into that role, there's a lot of pressures that come from this. Um, this, I guess, curated image of people that. Mm-hmm create online and you compare yourself to. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because I see a lot of stuff on social media that's very normalizing of the of the struggles of parenthood and postpartum, you know, body image, changes in the body, um, everything, right? But on the other hand, there's also, yes, absolutely. I love the word curation because it really is a curated you know, these accounts of, of families and parents that make it really difficult for people to, even though we know cognitively, hopefully, that that is a curation, separating that, having that input constantly, um, I think it really impacts our, our ability to be present in our own experience and to hold strong to our own values and, and even just the realism of what what's possible. You know, I use the term impossible parenting, which is from a book by Olivia Scobie, who is a Toronto um, perinatal therapist, social worker. And she really speaks to this sort of awareness of this child-centric 
culture and the concept of the quote unquote good mother. And it's, you know, you can really dig into that research when you start to see that 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 our how that's set up, how that structure is set up in terms of our culture and what we expect of mothers and what we expect, you know, what it means to be a good mother, essentially, or a good father. Um, yeah, I think social media really drives that that conversation and it can really impact people seeing it if you know if you're checking your phone for instance maybe you're feeding your baby and you're like checking your phone at the same time you're getting constant feedback about am i doing a good job right it's really hard not to compare yourself and that i think layered on to some of the other things that happen in postpartum plus of course for most people right now the level of uncertainty and stress that there is around the pandemic is almost a bit of a perfect storm. Now, previously you'd mentioned that um, the plummet in hormones that women experience post-pregnancy is almost akin to a second puberty, if you will. How long yeah. after pregnancy does it usually take for the body to find its new normal or return to its previous normal? Right. So, you know, it, most people don't return to their previous normal, to be honest, in terms of hormones, in the sense that often what will happen is we'll see changes in the menstrual cycle. Sometimes these are really positive changes. For instance, someone who might have had really heavy, painful periods might have lighter, more manageable periods. But in terms of like when, you know, how long does it take for hormones to readjust? you know, approximately two years as the baseline. That's what we use in terms of telling people like this is the recovery period before you should have another pregnancy um, in terms of the physiology. But it really depends on so many factors. Um, you know, it depends on whether someone breastfeeds or not. Um, that would, for instance, delay the return of the menstrual cycle, which would delay, you know, once the menstrual cycle comes back, then we start producing our progesterone again, because we produce progesterone when we ovulate. Um, estrogen is suppressed until breastfeeding is ceased. So that would still remain low in, in lots of people. But, um, you know, if we kind of zoom out from that, like, in when, when do you fully recover from those events? You know, some people would say maybe 10 years, you know, if you've got a couple of kids, if they're back to back, um, also depends on how old you were and what kind of health you were in, in before you, before you had a pregnancy. I noticed that, for instance, people who have their kids later in their thirties, which is really common in the city, might have their kids closer together if they're having more than one child. So the impact on terms of hormonal recovery would be different than someone who was having their kids a little farther spaced out or earlier in their reproductive life. That's interesting. Are there um, lifestyle factors that would also play into that? For example, like we know B vitamins are very important to the production of hormones and um, the methylation of the hormones and all of that. So if you're getting a diet that's super rich in B vitamins, for example, or omegas or things like that, that play a role yeah. in that hormone production, will that also influence at what point or how quickly you kind of return to a, a balanced state, if you will? Yeah, I think that if you consider it like are the building blocks for those hormones, um, if we're looking at hormonal health, are the building blocks there? So, you know, are you getting enough protein, for instance, to make those amino acids, which are really important for building the, the neurotransmitters like serotonin, et cetera? And are you getting enough fat in your diet to build the hormones? Because the hormones like estrogen, progesterone are on a backbone of of cholesterol, which is fat. Um, so certainly diet plays into it. And and if the pregnancy itself, and then if there's breastfeeding on top of that, can be very depleting in terms of nutrients. So it definitely, you know, the, how well you can take care of yourself in terms of diet and supplementation during pregnancy and postpartum can influence that balance for sure. Um, okay, so then for people that are suffering from postpartum depression, are there different signs you look for from um, kind of the standard list of potential indications? For example, like I know changes in hygiene can be listed as something to indicate depression. However, when you're a brand new mom, sometimes it can be a lot more challenging to get in that shower in the morning or to right. that's your time, right? Things like that. So yeah. Are there different signs that you look for? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, th- so it, when we're scre- with so screening for postpartum depression or anxiety, you know, there are standardized lists that, you know, a doctor or a naturopathic doctor would use a scale, right? And that we'd be looking at it. And you're right, they really overlap with, um, with kind of the normal experience of postpartum, for instance, sleep changes, insomnia or sleeping too much is, is a good example. But I think that what differentiates that is, first of all, the timing and the length of time that that person has been experiencing it. So, you know, like I said, after you have the baby, there's often you, an initial euphoria for the first 48 hours. You just brought a human into the world. You're a warrior. And then those hormones start to drop around, usually around day three or four is when there's a, that really big drop changes and the milk hormones really come in. Lots of crying, lots of um, big feelings around those days and, and an increased need for support there. After that, we have, you know, the first three or four weeks while you're adjusting, where lots of people up to 80% actually experience what we call like the baby blues. And that's when people are, you know, they might be alternating between feeling really happy and feeling really sad. There's some grief about their life, their previous life. There's happiness and excitement about their new life. There's changes in sleep because you've got a newborn. Um, And then there's all the physical changes like sweating um, and hot flashes, etc. After that initial sort of period of time, if you have persistent feelings, um, that's when we start to look at, okay, is there postpartum depression or anxiety risk here? And the differentiation would be in terms of like functioning um, and how severe those symptoms are, right? So depression would tend to be more like low mood. So lack of interest or, or lack of joy, inability to see like the good side of things, lots of sadness and crying, lots of guilt or, or shame or anger is another thing that comes up in, in new parents as well. And then for anxiety, it would, you might see things like flashbacks to unwanted flashbacks to the birth experience or something about the experience or intrusive thoughts are really common um, and can be really disturbing, which would be like standing at the top of the stairs and holding your baby and thinking, oh my God, I'm going to fall down the stairs or even imagining falling down the stairs. So it's when those symptoms are there and they persist. So it's more than two weeks past that first month. That's sort of where we start to go. That's where clinically based on those scales, we would say, hey, maybe you're experiencing something beyond that normal shift. It's also going to really depend on the person um, in terms of how they're experiencing it. It's hard to differentiate between those those normal changes, postpartum, for instance, and needing support. If there's not support, obviously, you're going to be struggling more, right? Or if you had, you know, a birth experience that was traumatic, you're going to be, you're going to struggle more. Um, and I think that's where it can be tricky for practitioners um, in the conventional medical model, they want to kind of put people in a, in a box, like you're suffering from postpartum depression uh, or you're, you know, having trouble adjusting. They actually call it like adjustment disorder. (laughs) Whereas in, in some other more holistic thoughts, we're looking at it as a whole picture, which is of course, somebody is going to be struggling when they're adjusting to a role like this. And of course, like lack of sleep is a huge, um, it mimics everything about postpartum depression and anxiety is mimics in sleep deprivation, which is really common in the first few months of new parenthood. So, you know, in terms of signs, we'd be looking for those signs of depression or anxiety in general, but the, them persisting beyond sort of two weeks and starting to interfere with fun- the ability to function, um, in particular, to be able to take care of the baby. So then if someone is suffering from uh, one of those conditions, whether it be postpartum depression or anxiety or um, any of those, would there be, what are some of the treatment options that they can safely take when they are still planning to breastfeed and want to um, take those steps in their parental journey? Right. So, you know, we, we, I think, starting off by saying that a lot of people um, are really resistant to medication in pregnancy and breastfeeding, even though that there's some good research to suggest that lots of the medications that they use are actually fairly safe. Um, But there are a lot of people who don't want to take that. And I think that that's another reason why we see people being underdiagnosed 
because they don't want to go to the doctor and talk about their symptoms because they're worried that all they'll be offered is medication. So that's where naturopathic medicine, we really have a huge role here because it's not just serotonin. I mean, we can safely use, for instance, St. John's wort in pregnancy and in breastfeeding um, to help support the serotonin pathways. That works best in people who have mild to moderate depression. It doesn't work as well in people who have really severe depression. But I I like to say that we have a, a greater toolbox in the sense that our best approach is coming from more than one angle. So we can influence not only you know, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, and we actually have in natural health supplements, for instance, we know that, you know, St. John's work works on serotonin, but lavender works on the GABA receptors and valerian works on the adrenaline if adrenaline's too high. So we can have a layered effect on the neurotransmitters, which is um, a bonus, but we can also work from things like what's happening in the hormonal picture. Sometimes we get clues from that based on the symptoms and how they're presenting now or from the person's previous um, history in terms of their menstrual cycle. We can also work on inflammation. In depression now, we can we see it is partially mediated by actual inflammation in the brain. And we know that pregnancy, especially late pregnancy and labor, is an inflammatory event. You need inflammation at your cervix in order for labor to initiate. So in the postpartum period, there's a massive amount of inflammation that we need to, that we can work on. Um, and then we can also work on that sort of HPA access and the stress physiology. Um, and there's different supplements we can use for all of those, um, lots of which are safe in, in breastfeeding um, and studied in breastfeeding, and some of which are really common. For instance, vitamin D. There's, a ver- there's quite a bit of research around vitamin D and um, not only depression, but also sleep um, in terms of how it affects our sleep, which can, of course, affect our mood as well. Interesting. Um, now, earlier you had mentioned uh, that, you know, how, this, the, how quickly you have your children, if you have multiple children, how close they are, things like that um, play into that hormone balance and kind of how quickly you recover. Does your overall age at which you start or when you're having your children play a role in your risk for these kind of conditions? Yeah, you, yeah, it's 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 interesting that it's sort of debatable. This most the some more recent research, this pandemic research I was speaking to was pointing towards younger mothers actually being at the most risk for PPDA. Um, which is postpartum depression anxiety, um, which I would I wonder if that means like less access to social supports. It doesn't so actually say in the research why that is. Um, but certainly other research has shown older parents at higher risk. So I think it's, you know, probably somewhere in between that maybe the risk is approximately the same or that it's hard to really differentiate based solely on age. I know that, for instance, in, a, in older parents that, yes, they're closer together. We, there's this concept of sort of postnatal depletion. It takes a lot for us to grow an entire human from, you know, two cells and then to give birth to it and then potentially to feed it from our bodies. And lots of people, again, if you're having your children a little closer together, maybe you're nursing still while you're in pregnancy, it can be hard to keep up with the level of nutrients. But the other thing that impacts that is, particularly for pregnancies in the 30s, is that perimenopause, which is that period before menopause, can start up to 10 years before your cycle actually ends. And so, you know, we know that menopause in most women starts between 45 to 55. So that means that for some people who would have a naturally earlier menopause, their perimenopause starts, could start around like even 35, which isn't an uncommon time for someone to have a first or a second or a third baby. So those hormone levels in perimenopause are fluctuating greatly as your body's adjusting, preparing for your cycle to end, you know, a decade later, but that will impact things as well in terms of age. So I guess in short, I don't know if the younger mothers in that study, if it was, I would assume that it's maybe more social support, whereas the risk in older um, parents might be more physiologically driven or hormonally driven. Mm 
Yeah, that study about the COVID is interesting. It made me think um, maybe it has something to do with like financial stability as well, right? Like usually when you're, sure. still, you're a little more stable, yeah. way, whereas the younger you're still figuring things out. Obviously, yeah. Here, but. No, but the, we know that the risk factors for PPD, for instance, like financial stress, marital stress, um, is it a wanted or planned pregnancy? Um, do you have support? Yes. Like, are you, how much is that going to change your life? Um, which might be more common in younger parents. Um, certainly that could be, that could be true. I don't know. They didn't specifically list it, but I, I would imagine that that's true. Uh, so then for pre-existing hormonal conditions, like you mentioned, thyroid plays into, um, the whole picture or things like PCOS or endometriosis that are specifically for women and inf influence uh, women's hormonal pictures. Does that play into um, a woman's risk of a hormonally driven mental health condition during or after pregnancy? Yes, yeah, certainly anything that's going to interact with the endocrine system for hormones is, is going to influence that risk. Um, Endometriosis is an interesting one because we used to think that endometriosis was caused by estrogen dominance, so high estrogen. And now we know that it's not necessarily caused by that. It's influenced by estrogen, but that it's actually more of an inflammatory or immune related um, disease. But in terms of thyroid, there's some pretty good associations between what's happening with the thyroid pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy and the risk afterwards. Um, that's, and that's being studied more now than it was before as well. And even diabetes can influence the risk, right? Because of, of that, how those hormones all interact. Um, it's certainly, it's, that's, it's, I think, an area where naturopathic medicine really shines because it's hard to say in terms of that research as a large umbrella, everyone with a thyroid, you know, a TSH um, number of this is going to be at risk. Like it's not been studied to that level of um, accuracy yet. But when we look at someone's individual risk factors, for sure, we want to take into account what's happening with, with anything that's hormonally related. And all those hormones, like I said, are kind of like a complex web. Um, and then we layer on the social, mental, you know, environmental stuff that's happening too, um, you know, in terms of support and what's the context of that, of that pregnancy, as well as nutrients, you know, what's the vitamin D like, what's their, what are their B vitamins like, what's their iron like, um, those things will all impact our, our mental health as well. And, and it's almost like everything postpartum in particular, but pregnancy as well, it's just exaggerated, right? Because of the sheer need to, the sheer need for the amount of hormones or the amount of nutrients to sustain the pregnancy or to sustain the child after it's been born. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, this is a fascinating topic and I'm sure we could probably talk about it for hours, but we have actually reached the end of our time. So for listeners who wanted to work with you, uh, what would be the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, they can go to my website, which is www.nikkithenaturopath.com. N-I-K-I is how you spell my name. Um, that's my website. I'm also on Instagram at Nikki the Naturopath. Um, and have lots of resources there, including a postpartum support plan, which is one of the biggest things that I talk about with people in pregnancy is preparing for the postpartum period in terms of what kind of supports are out there. One of the things that I'm super passionate about in, is, is helping people understand that there are so many different ways that we can approach mental health in pregnancy and postpartum, that sort of concept of it's not just serotonin. And in particular, destigmatizing people who choose to take medication as well and letting people know that if you're, if you're struggling with your mental health, getting help in any way that feels right to you is actually really important. Um, and it doesn't preclude having care in naturopathic medicine. A lot of what we do, we can work alongside medication or we can work completely on separate um, systems in the body that don't affect it too. So yeah, they can find me on my website or on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. Um, 
and Nikki Neeson, um, Dr. Nikki Neeson. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. And I think there's lots here for our listeners to take away and uh, learn more about. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Supplementing Health. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcast or aor.us slash podcast. Do you have a topic you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca.